Hi guys, and welcome to uh, this new session of Product with Benash. I'm super excited today to be speaking to one of the first user researchers at Miro. Uh, you guys must have heard about Miro. It's an online collaboration uh, platform. I'm sure uh, most of you who are here listening to us today have used the tool before. Um, we'll be talking to uh, Eduardo, who I'm going to welcome right now. Hi, Eduardo. How's it going? Hi, Axel, and, and hello, everyone. Doing really well. Just finish up um, Design a Sprint. OK, great. So busy day at, uh, at Miro, then. It is. It is normally a process we do it in a week time, and it's really compressed and, and time intensive. So happy to, to have completed one full round again. OK, brilliant. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about um, what you guys do at Miro, specifically what your team does. Um, before we get into um, uh, the detail, um, can you please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, um, what do you do exactly at Miro, and then we'll have a ton of more questions for you, I'm sure. Of course. So I'm Eduardo. I'm originally Spanish, and I have joined Miro as the first UX researcher. So my role basically entails understanding what are the different ways that people use the product and what are some of their needs and aspirations when it comes to collaboration. OK, that's great. Um, and I'm quite curious to understand how that, um, uh, that fit, that meet happened between you and Miro. How, how did that happen? How, how did you land at Miro and, and kind of like what attracted you there? No, great question, and and it's one. It was one that I answered through all of the interview process. And what what happens was we were in the middle of the pandemic. It was about April, May last year, and we we were forced to to work uh, remote. So I knew that there was going to be a drastic change into how we approach virtual collaboration. So I felt really compelled by the mission of the company, which uh, was around collaboration and creativity um, to really be part, uh, play a part in, in changing those rules and in, in changing how people collaborate. So I thought, yeah, this is totally for me. I'm fully driven by this mission. And then the more I interviewed, uh, the more I liked what I was uh, observing. So it's been great so far. Happy, happy to share more details later. Okay, amazing, um, great stuff. So um, I guess a lot has changed, right? So you just mentioned uh, the pandemic uh, around spring last year, um, and the company has been uh, scaling quite aggressively, right? So. Uh, I had a look online, and I think uh, from the same time in June last year, there was about 400 of you, and now there's nearly a thousand of you guys. So, how has this scaling been? Because you've doubled in size, almost doubled in size, and I'm sure you know it. It, it has meant something amazing for the company because uh, it also probably means success and traction. Um, but how was how have you gone through or, or experimented this impact around? Uh, the product team and, and also your, your practice of research? So at the beginning, uh, we would meet weekly and every week we would welcome new users, uh, sorry, new mirroneers. This is how we, we call uh, new employees. And, and this became a habit. Like every week we were welcoming a bunch of new people to a point that at the end we were having to make slides with the pictures because we didn't have uh, <laughs> enough air time to, to give them a, a to show everybody. Yeah, exactly. Like a formal inter company wide. So it's, it's been, it's been a tremendous growth, uh, which requires, you know, adding more structure and, and better communication, either synchronous or asynchronously. So it's, yeah, it's a, a huge uh, hyper growth uh, stage that happens just to a few companies and, and being part of, of this timing, this process is really cool because you can decide what you want to influence and, and there are many parcels where you can have impact. Okay, that's that sounds really great. And um, so tell us a little bit about 
how the 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 UX or design or product team were structured when you first joined? So I I joined uh, as part of the design team, and and back then um, there were the the head of design and and there were not different kind of managers in between. We were all reporting to to the same person. And we had, um, sorry, the designers had specific uh, domain areas where um, they were kind of plugged into. And that was replicating the product org, which meant that each product manager is having a, a specific area of the product that they are uh, owning. And, and design was serving those specific uh, needs for, for that area. As we have been growing, we have added a managerial level. So now designers report into this manager and this manager report into the head of design. And research has been scaling now like quickly, but for the first year, it's it's been uh, really uh, limited in capacity. So I had to wear different hats and try to <laughs> help here and there. And, and, and gotta be, gotta be yeah, a little bit everywhere, right? untangle every kind of research related uh, questions or challenge that were coming up. And this brings me to another question, actually. So um, let's start with this. So you mentioned um, design uh, essentially works as a service at Miro. So it's like a transverse function. There's a pool of uh, people that uh, work based on you know specific product teams, right? They are not actually embedded in the teams, are they? Not really, not really. Uh, they are embedded in teams, and, okay. and there is ownership in the design team, and that's really important because then you're not a service type of team, or mm -hmm. you are a, a core member of the team with equal voice. And mm -hmm. one of the highest benefits of Mio culture, what what of the highest wings and special things about Miro is the culture and within the culture is how collaborative uh, everyone is, which means that there is no this uh, dictatorship, uh, if we wanna relate to other <laughs> type of uh, organizations where someone defines what needs to be done and then everyone just acts on that decision. Here there is a, a lot of bottom up um, decision yeah. making which implies that designers and researchers have a strong voice into which problems should we solve? How can we solve those problems? What the solution looks like? And how do we put this in the market? Okay, that's really interesting. So in your past year at Miro, so I'm just thinking about you know the company scaling, you go from like 400 plus to almost a thousand people. Um, I often see this in other companies, right? You find out that other people somewhere in the company, especially as the company is becoming so big that you don't remember people's names now, right? There are new people in the company every week. You, you don't remember their names. And it's like all these new faces all the time. Um, there are people somewhere doing some form of research, right? And you're probably not aware of it. How do you deal with that? So yeah, this is a, a really good question because uh, there are different approaches to research and, and the one I brought to Miro, which really fit with what I found when, once I joined was uh, democratized research. And that implies everyone is not only allowed, is everyone is encouraged to conduct some sort of research. And in doing so, uh, I decided to empower people and not needing to bless their plans or their decisions. Rather, when they needed support, they could come to me and then I could give them feedback, guidance, uh, or work together with them in the first few sessions to ensure that they felt comfortable with the process, uh, the how to do it, and then uh, what to do next. So uh, there is an organic way of Mm -hmm. conducting research and that that was in place already and then what i tried to create is a little bit of a consolidation uh, of the knowledge the the processes and the tools so at the end we work all in a more efficient way and we can use each other's findings rather than duplicate what others have done 
And that's really great. And I know this is a particular challenge for a lot of companies uh, I speak to, you know, people in, in Europe in general, uh, is this idea that customer knowledge or insights is fragmented across different tools and different teams, right? How did you uh, go about this consolidation and having everything in one location? This is one of the biggest challenges we hear today in a lot of tech companies, right? Um, especially as they're scaling. Any like really concrete elements you can share with us around how do you go about that? How like what do you put in place? What kind of tools you, are you guys using? And and what is your experience of bringing other people onto this journey as well? Right. Absolutely. So first, I I try to understand how it was done, and then it was done in in many like multiple ways, and and really hard to match and put together. So it took me some time because at the beginning I was working on proving the value of research and empowering others to do research. So it was really towards my, my third quarter, uh, even fourth quarter at the company where I started to put together a, a insights repository. And I explored different ways, consulted different uh, research uh, leaders uh, outside of the company. And I ended up choosing a hack. And by a hack, <laughs> I mean, a tool that we were already using that could kind of do the job for some time until we have so many reports that they no longer can fit into this this tool. Mm -hmm. So our hack was Confluence. It's, it's mm -hmm. an Atlassian tool. And everybody at the company uses it because our processes, our how-tos are there. So we just found a way to link every past report that is research related, but not yeah. just from user research. We also involve analytics. We involve marketing research and some a bit less, but like go to market and, and customer success, like feedback into, into this. So what I try to do is centralize what we have learned in a standard report. So I create the standard report, giving everyone flexibility to capture their findings, but making it really synthetic is really one or maximum two pages. And we get um, anecdotal feedback elsewhere. So this is more for a more uh, purposeful design research or analytics that mm -hmm. has uh, specific research goals and, and a specific insights rather mm -hmm. than just something ever from. Like there are other tools for that, but so far that follows a different process. So I, I we have this, it's kind of working because still people don't do the self-serve way of searching, what do we know about X? But if I get asked or someone get asked, hey, what do we know about X? Then someone will find this in this repository and then share the link. So it's a lot easier than having to look through multiple tools um, to, to share many different links. Now it's all consolidated there and there are further links within the report. And how have you seen the, the engagement around this repository, right? I think um, you just mentioned that, you know, this, this is typically what happens to a lot of companies. Somebody has a question, they're not gonna start by trying to find it, they're just gonna wanna go and speak to someone, right? So. Somebody comes to somebody who then comes to you and goes, hey, Eduardo, do we know something about this thing? And then you share that research link. From there downstream, how have you seen the engagement? Do you think that you know, once people have found about this repository, they come back to it um, on a more self-serve basis? Or do you think it's still you know, quite challenging to get people to like, engage with it maybe more proactively? From the consumption side, I, I really doubt it because yeah, Confluence is not designed for this kind of uh, use case. There mm -hmm. are specific tools and I put them on the table while we did this due diligence. But again, like we are still a small research team. Maybe as we scale, we may uh, move to a different like specialized research tool. Mm -hmm. I think I got good traction from the, the inside generators. So everyone who is doing research has uh, 
engage with me for some guidance or feedback or simply sharing. And now every time they do a new uh, report, a new a new study, they they create the report in this new format and they link mm -hmm. it. So this is already much much better than what we had like six months back. From yeah, the demand side is is unclear, and it will need some education and training, and possibly we will end up moving to some other tool. Okay. This is re really interesting. Um, and this, I guess this brings me to, to my next question. Um, so we talked a little bit about how a lot of things have changed in the past year, right? So with COVID and everything, uh, more and more people have been working remotely and online. Um, and it's meant, it's probably also why the company has done so well, right? There's this like huge uh, increase in the number of people that need a way to collaborate online. Um, I'm just thinking from a research perspective, given you know this enormous traction behind the product, what has this meant for you like from a dis like product discovery perspective, right? Suddenly your product is being used by hundreds of thousands uh, and maybe millions of users. How, how has that been for, for you guys in the research team? The, the main implication was uh, changing the mindset. So let me give you a more concrete example of that. Uh, Miro has done a phenomenal job in, in building a solution that works for product development teams. And then that meant that the people uh, working at Miro, like Miro became 10 years old this week. So it's not that new, uh, but the last year has experienced like this tremendous growth and exponential adoption. But before, before that and before the pandemic, the, the product was having a strong product market fit with specific teams. And in a way, you were designing a, a solution that worked for someone like yourself. So even if the research happened at some level, you were not so different from the, the target audience. In fact, you were kind of the target audience. No, you were, could fit into that target audience. But as, as you mentioned, with the pandemic, we started to see primary and secondary school teachers joining. Uh, we started to see uh, people who work in sales. We saw in the pharmaceutical industry, lots of people doing manufacturing processes and discussions and collaborations all in Miro. And that is really different from what uh, we had seen before. And that required a uh, mindset change hey we are not designing for the same people that we were designing before we have now so many other people and they also have a strong product market fit so how can we better serve those and really start by understanding those people so my my whole goal was getting more people to conduct research and and feel firsthand the product through the eyes of others. And it was really uh, mind blowing for some of my team members to get to see how sharing a middle board was not that straightforward. Like clicking, sharing, you think everyone will discover that and will understand what that means. Well, guess what? Not, not the case for I, six I, years old. I have, I have to jump in here. I have to say in our team, uh, we had this conversation recently where people were saying, I'm sharing this board, but for some reason, I never understand whether who's like, who's going to have the rights to see this board. Like, is it me? Is it you? Is it anyone who has the link? It's just like this, so this whole like blurred area around who is going to get to see this board. Right. So I completely understand and I can completely relate with what you're saying. And then like one other step, like sharing might be, let's say a more challenging one, but creating a sticky note should be a duh. Like, yes, everyone knows how to create a sticky, a sticky note. But then when I gather small clips of people trying to create a sticky note and doing completely different thing, then people understood, wow, we need to revise this. And, and it's, it's really nice to see this mindset change and this user centricity and, and how they started to really place value into the research process, 
which meant for them dedicating 10 and sometimes even 20 hours of their week to engage with research. And that, yeah, that was a, a huge win for me, that organizational impact that, that implied, hey, let's really empathize with the users we are um, designing for firsthand. That's really interesting. And I guess you just mentioned something um, uh, around, you know, uh, empathizing with all these different groups of users, different types of users that you didn't have previously. Um, and you talked about creating time and space for you to be able to like, you know, go and speak with these people. How did you go about um, creating the time and space to be able to speak to so many different people, right? I guess this is one of the challenges today. Um, I speak with a lot of product teams who obviously have their heart in the right place. They know, you know, nobody's going to challenge you around product centricity or user centricity. Nobody's going to say, no, speaking to users is a bad idea. However, most people, when you ask them, when was the last time you spoke to a user, will tell you, you know, something like maybe last month or even worse, like six months ago. Um, obviously, as part of the research team, this is, I would like to think it's the critical mass of your time, right? That the bigger share of your time is understanding the user. How do you go about organizing your time so you can find the participants to conduct these interviews or, you know, quantitative research, however it might be? How, how do you go and organize that? Before all of those logistics, first you need to make believers, you need to make people love research and and you make that through having them experience emotional moments um seeing the value that research can bring which means like oh i have a lot more clarity into the decisions that i have to make or now we can move faster because really we know the direction versus trying different ways and after you've done that then you think about how to minimize their time spent in all of the logistics and, and process. So team first part, more important than the second part. And, and for the first part, what I did was conduct a few studies to quickly deliver value, bring people with me observing the sessions. So for some of them, it was their first experience with a UX researcher because there was none before. And then from there, and other people who were joining the company had experience before uh, this, this type of uh, processes. And then the adoption became uh, a lot faster and, and we started to see traction. And then I no longer had to push for doing research. I was now pulled by many different people. Hey, can you help us with this? Can you tell me what to do here? What can we do to, to make uh, this decision with more certainty? And then involving research early on in the, the product development process will make everything run a lot more smooth. So that first part, I think more important than the second part. Then second part is about um, the, the research plan process. So we choose the right method, we don't overdo it. So I tend to say less is more, but how to apply that principle. Uh, we prioritize uh, with certain criteria, so we really put effort and time into what matters. And then we recruit users in a non-time-consuming way. Then I had to bring some tools for that. And then fifth, we compensate people for their time. It was a, a fair way of compensating their opportunity costs and, and their feedback. So yeah, all of this implies uh, creating new processes and, and having how tos for each thing. But after, after one or two rounds, people could run with it, which means that you don't become the bottleneck. That was the, the biggest concern from the CEO uh, was, Edu, but how are you going to do not to be the bottleneck? You just run and you're going to get pulled. And then I said, tools over rules, which means I don't need to control or bless any plans gonna provide people with coaching, guidance, uh, and tools to do what they're doing in a higher quality manner, in a more efficient way, and with the right mindset, asking the right question, asking more why instead of, do you like this? 
-hmm. and then and then that is doing the trick for now and we are scaling so i think that the first phase of proving value uh has worked out then the adoption of more people doing research in a proper manner is really sticking and now we are expanding the research team so this these are kind of three different phases that are very cool to see great stuff so this i guess this is a really good segue into a question from uh, somebody in the audience so uh, Roma here is saying since you made the team autonomous in doing their own research what was the reason or justifications for scaling the user research team i guess that's that's a really that's a really good question it's like you're empowering more and more people to do research in the company uh, and then you'll go and speak to the ceo and be like listen i've got to i've got to have more people in my team how how does that how does that conversation go no it wasn't it wasn't that conversation it was these people were putting their time in doing research but when they wanted to do discovery research or co-creation research that required a lot of their time and they had all other responsibilities in place which means yes they believe in research and they want to dedicate time to research but is that the best way the best use of their time against the other priorities that they have so it has been the case because of capacity but they asked me hey edu like can we have one like you just dedicated to this area that we're working on and then i would raise this to the head of product and to the head of design hey guys shall we and then now is the time so we, we made a few hires and and we keep uh, having that pipeline of hiring researchers so we're going to open a couple or, or three more headcounts soon so it's it's really good we let them keep doing what they were doing but they realized that more complex studies or more time intensive studies they require mm -hmm. a dedicated person so this is a bit the the realistic picture like capacity at the end of the day is like even if they value research that the time invested is going to compete against other priorities and and the, the to-do list keeps growing so and i guess there's a, a question of maybe um different needs for different skill sets um how do you see yourself as a user researcher or, or, or you know other people the people that you're hiring uh, there's a particular skill set that is going to be helpful in particular types of exercises so you just mentioned exploratory research so um i know from experience not everyone can just like you know set up and do exploratory research right so how do you um you know how do you put some of these skills in front of some of these needs normally by understanding the decisions they want to make mm -hmm. so they want to make certain decisions they they know they need to um trade off different things normally there are competing alternatives or they need to estimate uh which feature is going to deliver which impact and based on that decide like how to rearrange the roadmap and and oftentimes when you ask them about the, the problems they they are solving these features are solving or some of the data that they need to make those decisions then oh they say i don't have this data so it comes in a way very naturally flowing from understanding the business problems and the user problems and seeing where the the gap of information is and mm -hmm. with that we define together the research you frame problem. the research okay right that's really interesting um and i guess one of the questions I have now, so I guess there was this first phase of you talked about, you know, getting people to love research and and probably, you know, evangelizing the role of research in, in the company. Um, and I guess that was part of your mandate joining Miro as well. Um, now you, you're entering this, this second phase, right? So you're going to hire more people. The team is going to expand. What are some of the challenges you foresee for like the coming year or the coming you know couple of years around scaling research in the company, but also supporting all of these other people that want to practice research in the company? So 
I've I've hired well me and the head of design. We have hired a head of research, so I, I will start reporting into this woman like really soon, and and together we'll need to first establish what's the research culture, which now there is one, but now we need to define. Okay, now when we have more resources, do we want to change any of this? Do we want to create uh, clear boundaries into what anybody should do versus what the specialists UX researchers should do. Plus now there is also a marketing research team and then what should they do and, and how are we all uh, aligning? Uh, but yeah, other than that type of alignment, I think we will keep seeing uh, a high demand for research and a need to decide what is a priority and what is going to fall above the prioritization line versus not. And in my past roles, also always that was a challenge. So it was not mm -hmm. about ability or skills to execute. It was more about what is above that line and what's below. And then the biggest challenge I see next is how to have a greater business impact. So let's say we are all part equal members of the product teams and we're already having strong product impact but how do we have also business impact and define some of the different strategies the company will <clears throat> go after that is a greater conversation and with with this new leader joining miro i hope that we'll have uh, more clarity and and we'll be able to also deliver value and in, in that way Okay, that's that sounds exciting. Um, I'm just going to go back now to um, your collaboration with the product team, which I guess is also a, a central question in a lot of companies today. So, how do product managers collaborate with uh, designers, UX designers, and use and UX researchers, etc.? Um, I had a conversation with uh, Teresa Torres recently around uh, continuous discovery in companies, and she was talking about how. The reality of a product team is that 80 to 90% of our time, we're talking about solutions, right? We're in the solution space. We're talking about features, we're talking about delivery, and we're talking about very concrete things because the, the whole role itself is organized around shipping things. So what do we have to show? It's, it's all about what can you show for, for, for yourself? And if you think about it, our progress as product managers in companies is also often measured around what we shipped, what we what we produced, what we delivered. And I feel a lot of companies struggle, specifically companies where they want to build a discovery first culture. So like, mm -hmm. as in, let's not take this for granted. We've got to, you know, go and understand the why behind this, uh, why this user is saying this or, or behind this problem. They struggle with uh, aligning the value of what they're doing or what they would like to do in terms of research or product discovery to business impact. That leap is quite a big one, right? So saying, we're going to go and organize this activity and maybe we'll find out about something that maybe will have an impact on the business. How do you go about helping whether it's product leaders or C-level people or in general people in the company understand the value of these product discovery activities or these research activities and the business impact that might come from, from these, right? Look, uh, you are asking, you're coming from a very hierarchical place where you need a lot of blessing and approvals. I believe more in if you are determined, if you know there is value here, you have this hunch with some data maybe about it, just dedicate some portion of your time to go after that. And that's, for example, the case of something I'm doing this quarter. There was no clarity into how to prioritize or why to prioritize this, but I said, I'm gonna put some percentage of my time to explore this because sooner or later we need to solve for this. So let me understand what's the context, what are the associated problems, what tools are being used for this. And, and later we'll figure out how Miro can untap into that opportunity. And, and that 
let's say 80 20 rule has worked like 80 percent of my time is going to be into things that i discuss with everybody else in the team 20 percent is going to be research led which means is my free time kind of to dedicate to the areas that I think are worth uh, investigating. And that has worked for me well in the past. And I, I inherited that from my manager back then. And, and I think it's, it's a good approach. And other companies also use this. It's not just research specific uh, settings. Mm -hmm. So this leap of faith just needs um, a split of time dedication. And then if you don't see it will move the needles, then you will move to the next thing. So and I guess, and I guess um, there's a lot of truth in what you're saying. And, and this is what I also hear from um, people that have tried this before uh, and, and it has worked. I guess there's an element of, um, ask for forgiveness, don't ask for permission. So there's something along those lines. Yes. Um, and, and there's also something about if you go and do the research activity or you know do, do some, some product discovery and find out about something really valuable for the business, nobody's gonna tell you, why did you come with such amazing insights, right? <laughs> like correct, pe correct. Pe people should be thanking you and will say, this is great, this is gonna help me at some point make a decision or like you said before, uh, inform a trade-off that we have to do this year or you know, in the roadmap, et cetera. So I completely get that, but still I feel a lot of people write to us and ask about, I, I'm not kidding, every week somebody sends me a message and asks me about how do you get these people at the company to let us do this kind of work? And I'm like, don't ask for permission, like just do it and then you'll figure it out later, right? Yeah, and then like the, the really next step that I want to do is connect OKR planning, which is yep. the, the way that we prioritize our efforts to existing research insights, including the ones that are more exploratory. Because once you, that, you do that click, then everything is going to fall into place and we're going to go after the right opportunities and solving the right problems. So just that ask for forgiveness uh, and then hope that that connection is made like you deliver them on time for someone to reprioritize. The Be thing. able to re leverage it, yeah. Um, I'm gonna pick another question here from uh, the audience. So uh, Sergio saying, hi Edu, really interesting how you built the mindset at Miro. How do you see the future of UX research having customers worldwide with their different customs? Really good question. So my, my speciality before here when I worked at Uber was global research. And, and I think that will also um, come to Miro. Like now we don't distinguish by location when we, um, sample our users but at some point we will and we will see how specific rituals and habits work well in a culture like india and may not work well in argentina or brazil and then being able to localize the experience uh, to their local nuances is going to be something really important but i don't think that's also the future of UX research, like that's the present and it depends on where each company is. And Miro is, is now making some good progress on, on that front too. Um, I think we're, we'll start to see more AI, um, privacy first type of, of research. So as companies adopt these good practices of uh, privacy and accessibility, then we will see a lot more experts into those fields having a strong voice and potentially even better power to say, hey, this is not meeting the bar. So I anticipate the future going more to ensure we build accessible products and that are um, well informed by these standards and, and what people will do with them. Okay, that's that's really interesting. Um, and this brings me to another question, actually, around uh, the same theme. So, um, 
I had a chat earlier this year with Marty Kagan uh, from the Silicon Valley product group about the future of a product manager's role. So he was telling me that in his opinion, in the next five to 10 years, a project, a product manager's role is going to change quite a lot. They're going to do less and less delivery related work and more and more discovery related work. Right. So somewhere in that transition, a product manager is going to be is going to have to be a little bit more conscious of their own biases um, because mm -hmm. they're going to have to do more research activities, more interviews, uh, more uh, data related uh, queries, you know, things like that. Um, how do you see, you know, this evolution between uh, UX uh, design and product manager, this, this collaboration? How do you see that evolve in the coming years? It's it's a really a hard question. Like ideally, the the role of the researcher is embedded into the subheads of of some of these roles that you have mentioned, and then researchers can do deep dives into specific scenarios, contexts. Like for example, one that I'm really curious about is now as we go back to office some people in office, some people at home, like how is that going to work? And um, the ergonomy of the meeting rooms and compatibility of existing devices there. Um, so yeah, the, the role of the UX research, you know, basically you would like to understand my view on that. Yeah, I guess. So one of the things uh, I think we're seeing is that um, just to be really concrete, right? Um, there is a there is a growing demand in UX researchers. Okay, that's just a fact, and you can see it from the job boards, uh, and you can you can see it across the industry as well. Because as more and more companies become more mature around uh, in terms of UX maturity, they want to integrate this skill set in house. So either through UX designers or actually dedicated people to research, so UX researchers. Mm -hmm. The challenge is there are not enough um, universities or training courses producing these researchers uh, at the rate where the demand is, right? So at some point, some random people have to upskill and become user researchers, right? So these are people that maybe before were customer success managers or product managers or designers. Um, and I guess, I can see this great divide in the research world. There are people that are very dogmatic about you've got to have, you know, been to university, have done a master's degrees in psychology, have studied, you know, um, human interface de like design and all this kind of stuff or, or uh, ergonomics, things like that. And other people that have a, a very democratized approach to user research, not so much about all your credentials and whether you studied psychology uh, in a master's degree, but it's more about your ability to empathize with uh, people in front of you and really understand what they're telling you, but also what they are not telling you. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what I'm trying to understand. Where, What is your opinion about how this job is essentially going to evolve given that people around this job, designers and product managers are also going to have to stretch their skill sets, right? So, Currently, it's really hard to, to find um, researchers. Like the processes that I've been following like took several months, which speaks about the scarcity. And even though there are specialized programs, there are not that many people who follow that path that there is not even a single path to become a researcher. And whoever tells you that, like I, at least based on all of the colleagues I had in the past, each has their own thing. People who are trained in specific like design uh, degrees, they they have already started with that uh, background. But I think people coming from other disciplines bring a, a really uh, com compatible and complementary view to that. I am not personally trained in design. I'm, I'm trained as an engineer. And then that helps me speak the language as other engineers speak or product managers speak. And then it works. So back to your question, I think there will be more specialization within researchers 
and that's already starting to happen. And then when you see an accessibility researcher, then it's going to be in high demand because that person knows all of the things and techniques mm -hmm. and ways to to check for that, uh, to recruit for that, uh, to help companies with that particular thing. And then I anticipate that more of that will will happen in in research. So you you will see dedicated roles that maybe uh, will screen for a specific past experience. But I think experience is really critical. Like you need training to understand like the the core of the research, but the practice and implementation of that, which often takes some time for people coming from academia to really mm -hmm. enter into the, the fast cycles that the industry yeah. has. So I have coached and mentored a few people to make that transition and see how they have all of the knowledge. They just need to apply it in a different way. And mm -hmm. I think the, the, the segue from academia to research and like adapt versus coming from another discipline, you mentioned like customer support to research, maybe that adaptation process is similar for both. Like one needs to mm -hmm. understand more the business and the industry side, and the other one needs to understand more the research side. And both are learnable. Uh, and yeah, so I, I don't see a challenge with that. And it will be it will be a fun time, I guess. I think, as you said, the higher the demand is for research, the more we will see companies having research team and researchers having a voice at the table. And that mm -hmm. will become like more interesting, like how we can be forward, like future forward um, companies and teams that um, are going to have their own uh, directions because they have seen signals in the market and they really understand the users. So that, that will be, I think, the interesting change. Okay, amazing. Um, before we wrap up, I'll just take another question from the audience. So. Kama, who's here, is saying, to what extent is it, it is it essential to be synced about research tools, frameworks, and methods while rapidly growing? How did you cope with that? Wow, great question, Kama. So I think it is important as long as you know what you're doing. So all of the frameworks and tools will give you guidance and confidence into doing it in a particular way. And I'm a very experimental type of researcher, which means I also empower people and my interns, I can kind of speak about it to adapt methods and even create their own methods or merge methods to, to try different ways of doing it and then reflect on that. But for people with no uh, research training, this is really the guardrails of I'm doing the right thing. And this is kind of bulletproof. And, and then pushing them through a process that has worked for others and that others can really comment on is a lot easier than just telling them, oh, go and experiment, try different ways of answering that question. So that, that was my, my uh, way of placing importance into the how by like giving people especially confidence and guidance of, of doing the right thing. Then for experienced researchers, experimenting is, is often really recommended. Brilliant. Um, listen, uh, we're we are coming to a close now. I just wanted to uh, take some time and thank you again uh, for taking the time to do this uh, with us today. It was super insightful. Uh, I want to say good luck with skating the team and welcoming uh, your new leader. Uh, we're all very excited and curious uh, to see uh, what are some of the new features that are going to pop up on our mirror screens soon because you guys have a phenomenal uh, delivery pace. So um, thanks for all the hard work uh, you guys are putting because it's also helping us uh, in other companies to, to, to do a better work and, and be more creative. Um, good luck with, yeah, with everything. And I hope we get to speak to you soon. Yeah, get ready in, in October. We'll have yep. a, a company-wide conference with 20,000 people where we will have so many, many updates. So get ready for that. It's a free conference, several days, and it's super fun.
Okay, amazing. We'll look out for that. Thanks so much, Eduardo, and yeah, speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.